Well, good evening. It's good to see you guys here tonight. Those of you who are watching online right now, we greet you as well. We uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And hey, we're gonna um, we're gonna continue our study in the Book of Revelation tonight. But we're not gonna be in the Book of Revelation. We're gonna be in First Thessalonians tonight. Uh, if you want to turn there, you can. First Thessalonians chapter four is what we're going to give our attention to. And we're, going to uh, we're going to look at verses 16 through 18. And let me explain what's going on. So far in our study of the book of Revelation, we've been studying verse by verse, line by line, chapter by chapter. That's how we do here at Calvary Chapel Wilmington. Right now, we've studied the first five chapters of the book of Revelation. And we're about to go into chapter 6. Matter of fact, next Tuesday... We're going to jump right into chapter 6. Now, last Tuesday, I told you, between chapters 5 and 6, a very important end times event takes place. Um, and that event is called the rapture of the church. Um, and we place it, some guys place it in chapter 4 of, 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 uh, of, of, of Revelation. Some guys place it in chapter 5. It really doesn't matter just as long as before chapter 6, right? And, um, and so uh, that's what we're doing tonight. We're looking at a very important event, an end times prophecy called the rapture of the church. If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry. We're going to put all of the scriptures up on the screens and you can follow along with us there. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to read verses 16 through 18. Let me read it. You follow along and then we're going to pray after that and ask God to bless our study. This is what we're told. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, um, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And therefore, comfort one another with these words. Father, we come to you now. And, Lord, we're taking on a very controversial subject within the Christian church today. Lord, we're talking about the rapture of the church. And we're asking, Lord, that you would give clarity. We're asking that you would give understanding. Um, we're asking, Lord, that, uh, that you would allow us to just read your scriptures, read the word, and that you would give us a clear understanding of, of this um, very important end times event that we believe is going to take place before the great tribulation, Lord. And uh, so, Lord, would you just do a good work? Uh, would you use me to communicate your word in a way um, that, that is humble, but in a way that is, is, is clear and concise? Uh, would you do that work, Lord? And would you do it through the power of your spirit? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you remember back in August of 2005, a Category 5 hurricane was about to make direct landfall on New Orleans. And the hurricane was named Katrina. You guys remember this. And the highest wind speed recorded was 174 miles per hour. Uh, hurricane Katrina went down in history as one of the costliest and strongest hurricanes on record, causing $108 billion in damage. Altogether. Now, before Hurricane Katrina made landfall, the city officials of New Orleans, <clears throat> they knew that they had to do something to evacuate millions of people. And so they strategized, they planned, they put all of these things uh, uh, forth. Uh, they, 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 they got the best strategy, the best plan, and, and they all agreed on it. And when they put it forth, when they executed it, it was complete chaos. There was long lines, the roadways uh, were packed, and, and, and at the end of the day, we could sum it up like this. Their plan, their strategy to evacuate millions of people out of New Orleans failed. And um, you see, we categorize these hurricanes. You guys know this. We live on the coast of North Carolina. We're used to hurricanes. But we categorize these hurricanes with numbers, one through five, five being the strongest and the most destructive. Well, the Bible tells us of another storm that's coming, a storm that if categorized would be a 10 or better. 
And in and, and, and this storm, it's not blown up by the sea. It's not blown up by the warm air and, 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 and the temperature of the water and all. Nothing like that. This storm is blown up by God's judgment. And this storm is called the Great Tribulation. And I'm guessing you saw the video footage, uh, the photos from all the damage and the constru- uh, destruction that was caused by Hurricane Katrina. Well, let me tell you something. The damage and the destruction that just New Orleans saw in just one Category 5 hurricane, that is just child's play compared to what the earth is going to go through during the Great Tribulation. Christians, I know that was a tough way to start our night. But let me tell you something. You should be of good cheer. If you can raise your hand tonight and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, you should be of good cheer because God has provided an, ac- uh, an evacuation plan for us before, uh, before this storm, this great tribulation takes place. And this evacuation plan is called the rapture of the church. And I can assure you of something. Unlike the evacuation plans that failed there in New Orleans, God's evacuation plan will not fail. The Bible tells us that there is coming a day when millions of Christians are going to be taken away from this world. And and on that day, and in that moment when it occurs, airplanes are going to begin to plummet from the skies down to the earth because pilots have been removed from the cockpit, driverless buses, subways, cars, trains, all kinds of transportation is going to cause unimaginable damage and disaster. Doctors and nurses, they're going to seem to have abandoned their, uh, uh, their patients. Even surgeons who have been operating on patients are going to be suddenly taken away and gone. In some instances, the patient that was being operated on is going to be gone. Children are going to go missing from their beds. People will be running through the streets looking for missed fa- uh, uh, missing family members uh, who were there just a moment ago, and, and now they're gone. And panic is going to grip every household, every city, every town, and every country around this world. The day after this event, known as the rapture, the headline in every newspaper in the world is going to be talking about it. A typical article in the newspaper might sound something like this. At 12.05 last night, a telephone operator received three frantic calls regarding missing relatives. Fifteen minutes later, all communications were jammed with similar phone calls coming in. A spot check around the nation soon discovered the same situation in every city, every community, every state. Sobbing husbands sought information about the mysterious disappearance of their wives. One husband said this, I turned on the bed light to ask my wife if she had remembered to set the alarm and put coffee in the coffee pot, but she was gone. Her bed clothes were there, but she had vanished. I don't know where she's at. A woman said, my husband just returned home from the late shift. He was home for five minutes, and I can't find him anywhere. That's what a typical article in the newspaper is going to sound like after the rapture of the church. And again, the Bible tells us there's there's coming a day when millions of Christians will be taken away from this world. And I can't stress it enough, that event is called the rapture of the church. And listen to me, on the timetable of end time events, the rapture of the church is the next event to take place. Nothing else needs to happen before the rapture. The rapture can happen any moment, at any time, whenever God chooses. And man, I was so hoping God would rapture the church right when I said that. That would have been pretty cool, wouldn't it? Gosh, that would have been classic. Now, in talking about the rapture and, 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 and where we place it in order of end time events, what it likes to do first is give you a definition of what the rapture is, and then we're going to make our way back through the scripture that I just read to you, and we're going to examine it a bit more closely to understand a little bit more about the rapture. Um, so what exactly is the rapture? Let's, let's, let's give it a definition. If you're taking notes, you might want to write it down this way. The rapture is an end times event where Jesus himself is going to remove, or you can use the word evacuate, 
He's going to remove the church, or you can use the word Christians. He's going to remove the church, Christians, from the earth and into heaven. But you've got to add this part, before God pours out his judgment upon the earth. That is our definition of the rapture. I'll read it to you again because I see a lot of you taking notes. The rapture is an end times event where Jesus will remove or evacuate the church or Christians from the earth and into heaven before God pours out his wrath upon the church. Now, in a moment, give me some time. I want you to be excited about this, but give me a little bit of time. In a moment, we're going to put a chart up on the screens. And, and when we get there, I'm going to show you an end times events chart, and I'm going to explain to you exactly where we place the rapture of the church and when, generally speaking, when we believe it's going to take place. Not, of course, the day or the hour or anything like that. We'll cover that in a minute. But generally speaking, when we believe it's going to take place. Now, with that understanding, come back to our text. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 16 through 18. We're going to learn a few details concerning the rapture. And, um, and just so you guys know, I'm giving the topic of the rapture one uh, Tuesday night. Uh, we could fill up five, six, probably even 10 Tuesday nights talking about the rapture. I'm giving you some very general information tonight just to maybe whet your appetite for studying the rapture of the church a little bit more on your own. Uh, so, so, so just bear with me. I'm not going to get into every single detail, every single word and phrase and everything in this passage. I'm just going to give you, again, the general concept of what we see here. So verse 16, we'll begin there. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Listen, the plain understanding we just went through that IBS seminar, right? What's the plain understanding of the text? The plain understanding of this verse says that there's coming a time where Jesus will descend from heaven for his church. That's the plain reading of the text. And at this event, verse 16 tells us very clearly that the dead in Christ will rise first. Well, we've got to ask a question here, right? The question is, who are the dead in Christ? If they're going to rise first, we need to know who they are. The dead in Christ is a reference to Christian believers who have already died. When Jesus raptures the church, he will first gather the bodies of those Christians who have, who have already died, and he's going to bring them into heaven. Well, wait, Pastor Nick, hold on. We're going a little bit too fast here. Let me ask you a question, Pastor. I thought that when a Christian dies, they go right into heaven, right into the presence of God. But, but you're saying that, you know, that when the rapture happens, that the dead in Christ are going to rise first and go into heaven, right? Well, yeah, li listen, l let me tell you like this. If you believe that when a Christian dies and that they go into heaven, let me assure you of something. You're absolutely right. Their soul, their spirit goes into the presence of God while their body is laid to rest. But this is what happens. When the rapture occurs, when Jesus comes for his church, the bodies of those Christians who have already previously died will be resurrected and reunited with their spirit, their soul, which is in heaven. Well, this brings up a side issue. Because if I don't mention this, somebody's going to come up and be like, well, Pastor Nick, what about this? Let me just mention it as a side note, right? And we're not going to go too far into this. And again, this is a controversial subject within the Christian church. I'm just going to give you my personal opinion, okay? This brings up this subject of cremation versus burial, right? Uh, will, will God be able to resurrect a person, a, a body that has been cremated? Um, some Christians have wondered about this. The short answer, in my personal opinion, is yes, I believe he can do it. It's not a problem with God. God is the one who created the universe um, out of nothing. So I do believe that he can just somehow, how he wants to do it is no problem with him finding particles and pieces of someone's body and reuniting them and stuff. I mean, I've told Jesse several times when I pass away, I want to be cremated. And um, if Chris is still around, I want Chris to take me 100 miles out on the ocean and dump my ashes out in the ocean. I grew up in a commercial fishing family. I love the ocean, 
And that's where I want to be. I want my ashes spread at the ocean. And, and, and that's just what I want. And I believe God has no problem, you know, finding those particles and pieces and reuniting my spirit and my body together. I, I just don't think he has a problem doing it. If you believe what God did in Genesis, creating the earth out of nothing, then he can certainly find particles and pieces within his creation and put us back together. But a lot more can be said about it, but we're not going to get sidetracked on it. But listen, when we, we, we have to understand when the rapture occurs first, the first thing that happens is that the dead in Christ will be resurrected and reunited with their spirit. That's the first thing that happens. Well, what happens next? Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them, with them, those who previously died before us, right? With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now notice something here. First notice those two English words, caught up. This is very important for the understanding of the rapture. Those two words are the English translation of the Greek word uh, harpazo. If you want to know how to spell it, it's H-R-P-O-Z-O, harpazo. That's the Greek word for the English words caught up. Now, this Greek word harpazo carries the idea to snatch or to take suddenly. And, and, and there is no doubt when this word harpazo is used here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, it refers to snatching away or taken suddenly away. And, and, and when it's used in this context, it's taking people from the earth. And so what, what we're reading here is that when it says, then when you who are alive and remain shall be called up, you're going to be snatched away, you're going to be taken away suddenly, is what that's saying. And, and make sure you understand, there is a generation of believers out there who will escape death and will experience the rapture of the church. It, it, they, they will. And, and, and if you want to know my opinion, this is my opinion. It's my hope. I mean, I heard my grandparents talk about it. Both of my sets of my grandparents have passed on. They're in heaven right now. But I heard my grandparents saying, we're the generation who are going to see the rapture of the church. It's my personal opinion that we're the generation that is going to see the rapture of the church. That's my hope. I believe that we are the generation. This world cannot go on much longer the way it's going without God stepping in and doing something. And I believe we're so close to the rapture. I believe we're so close that any minute, it, I literally believe this, any minute God is just going to say to his son, Jesus Christ, go get him. Go get him. Trumpet's going to sound. They're going to, Jesus is going to snatch the church Christians away from the earth, and it's going to be sudden, and it's going to take place in an instant. I, I believe it with all my heart. Notice also at the end of verse 17, we're told, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The question is always asked when, when talking about the rapture of the church, where will Jesus take us after the rapture? Where are we going to go? Well, Jesus answered this question back in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. Uh, you can write those references down. I got Just by the way, I have a lot of references for this message tonight. We're going to put every single one of them up on the screen. So don't feel like you got to turn to everyone in your Bible. I did get them correct. I'm not going to lie to you. All right. So listen, listen. G Jesus answered this question. John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will. What does he say? I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So you understand. After the rapture, we shall be with Jesus Christ in heaven. Now notice verse 18. Let's not skip verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Christians, the truth of the return of Jesus Christ for his church and for his people and the truth that we will always be with the Lord, it should excite us and it should be a source of comfort for every single one of us. Matter of fact, we, we're told very clearly in verse 18, comfort one another, encourage one another with these words. On Sunday mornings, on Tuesday nights, whatever it may be, wherever you're at, a home Bible study, no matter what it is, you should be encouraging and comforting each other with these words. Listen, I, I don't know what you may be going through tonight. You may be in the midst of some trial. 
You may be in the midst of some controversial uh, controversy, something bad taking place in your life. But let, let me just comfort you, Christian, with these words in verse 18. The truth of the matter is this. You will be with the Lord. You will be. No matter what happens, God loves you. He, he, he's going to take you one day. If you don't pass away uh, you know, before then, your soul will be with the Lord and all. But he will come for you. He will come for his church. He will come for Christians. And you will be in his presence forever. That's comforting and encouraging words. So from the passage we just read, the plain understanding is this. There will be a rapture. There will be a time when Jesus comes and suddenly removes his church from this world and takes them directly into heaven. There is no doubt about this. This is certain Bible scholars, theologians, for the most part, we all agree on it. This is a belief and a, a, a hope held by the majority of the Christians around the world. This is a very clear teaching from the Bible. So we understand that. Now let me go to the opposite side. Exactly when this event takes place on the timetable of end time prophetic events is a huge debate among Christians. You see, for the most part, we all agree that the rapture is going to take place. But when it happens is when we argue and debate and whatever word you want to throw in there. It is no secret that it is one of the most controversial issues and subjects within the Christian church today. So here's what we all agree on, at least the majority. Let me take you through this uh, the way I understand it in my mind. There will be a period of seven years that, um, um, it, that God's judgment is going to be poured out on sinful humanity. We call this seven-year period uh, the, the tribulation, the great tribulation. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 6. It starts in Revelation chapter 6. It ends in Revelation chapter 18. Next Tuesday, we're going to jump into chapter 6, and that's when we're going to begin the study of the great tribulation. It's a seven-year period. Now, the debate about the timing of the rapture centers on where it happens in this seven-year period known as the great tribulation. We're going to put the chart up, but there's three primary schools of thought on when the uh, rapture is going to take place. Well, here's the chart. I hope some of you in the back can read it. We try, I tried to get a chart that was big enough. Now, just so you know, for those of you in here and those of you online, uh, I, I understand this. There are some things missing from this chart. There, there, um, I didn't put up every single end time prophetic event that's going to happen because it would just take too much room and I thought it would take away from the attention. I just put up some simple things because I wanted you to see a couple of things here. Right now, we are living in the present church age. That's where we live. Oh, and by the way, when we started our study of Revelation, I told you we had a gift for you. Well, I'm going to give everybody um, um, that comes to this study a chart. You're going to have a chart, and it's going to be like a bookmark that you can keep in your Bible. Uh, we, we're working on that right now. We're going to get that to you soon. Uh, but you're going to get a chart similar to this. It's going to have a little bit more information. But we're living in the church age. Now, notice at the bottom, right after the church age, we, I put rapture of the church. That is when we believe that the rapture is going to take place. Because right after the rapture, we have where it says the beginning of sorrows and the great tribulation. We believe the great tribulation, the, the tribulation, however you want to say it, is going to start right after the rapture. Now, let me, just, let me just work my way through this, if you would. There's three primary schools of thought when it comes to the timing of the rapture of the church. The first is what I just explained to you. We call this the pre tribulational rapture position. And that's the position we hold here at Calvary Chapel. Um, this position states that Jesus will rapture the church. He'll suddenly take away the church before the seven-year great tribulation. Now, the next school of thought is what we call the mid-tribulational rapture position. In Bible college, we call these guys the mid-tribs, right? The mid-tribs. And, and that position says that um, um, Christians, the church, will go through the first half of the Great Tribulation, 
And then at the, at the half of it, which will be three and a half years, right? We know seven years is the Great Tribulation. Three and a half years, you see the chart? At three and a half years, God will rapture the church right in the middle of the Great Tribulation. That's what the mid-trib say. I have problems with that. And then the third position is the post-tribulational rapture position. We call these the post-trib guys. These guys are, I just do not believe this. I don't even think they have a biblical ground. I, I just don't believe it one, one bit. Well, this position states that the Christians, the church, will go through the entire seven-year great tribulation, right? And at the very end of it, at the very end of the tribulation, seven years, at, right before the return of Christ right there, um, God will rapture the church. Make sure you understand. Just a side note. When you see right here at the end of the great tribulation, you see where it says the return of Christ? That's the second coming of Christ. Don't get the rapture of the church, Jesus snatching the church away. Don't get the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ confused. It's two totally different events. Um, Jesus will come to rapture the church before the tribulation, but he'll come. The second coming of Christ is at the is at the end of the tribulation, and that's where he reigns. You see right there where it says the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus will reign on the earth for a thousand years, and then there's a couple more events to take place after that. We're going to study them all on uh, Tuesday night here, um, um, here at Calvary Chapel. Now, again, there's these three primary schools of thought when it comes to the timing of the rapture. And you should know Christians in each camp truly believe they're right. I mean, they, they, they've studied the scriptures. They truly believe they figured it out. Uh, they, they believe their position is biblical and that everyone else is wrong. And I'm saying that as well. I think that what I got going on. Oh, let's get Brent out of here real quick. But listen, they, they truly believe that, the, uh, that, 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 that they're right. And, and I'm, I'm saying that I believe I have it right by taking a pre-tribulational position but the, the question that everyone has to ask themselves, no matter which one you pick, is can you back it up biblically? Now look, here at Calvary Chapel Wilmington, on Sunday mornings, you know, we have, I don't know, we have 80 to 110 people attend our church on average. And, and I'm friends with a whole bunch of those people. I like to say I'm friends with all of them. And we talk you know, about certain issues and stuff. On Sunday mornings, there's people sitting in this church who have a mid-tribulation point of view. They say, Pastor Nick, I just disagree with you on the pre-trib. It's mid-trib. And then there's other people who have the post-trib point of view. Now, we all agree that the rapture is going to happen. We just disagree on when it's, when it's going to happen. And listen, there's no need to break camp and run from the person who holds a different view from you. Okay, it, it, It's just the way it is. I got friends, we debate and, you know, have kind arguments, if you would, all the time about this. There's no need to just break camp and disassociate and not fellowship with someone who holds a different view on the rapture than you do. Now, we're saying all of that, I believe, and I'm persuaded biblically, that the pre-tribulational rapture position is correct, and I want to spend the rest of our time tonight telling you why I believe it, and I want to back it up biblically. Um, now, remember what the pre-tribulation rapture is before going into this. It's saying that God will rapture the church before the great tribulation, before the seven-year great tribulation. I'm going to give you four reasons why I believe this. Scholars who have done, spent a lifetime studying this, uh, you'll find that they have 50 or more reasons on why the uh, pre-tribulation rapture is the best one to take. But I'm going to give you four of my favorites. The first reason why I believe in a pre-tribulational rapture is because the Bible clearly teaches that God has not appointed Christians, he's not appointed his church to his wrath. Now, you have to remember what the seven-year great tribulation is. We're going to get a lot more into this next Tuesday when we begin our study of it. But if you're taking notes, write this down. This is a definition of the seven-year tribulation. It is a time when God will pour out his wrath upon the earth and upon unrepentant, God-rejecting people. That is the definition of what 
the, the tribulation is. It's a time when God will pour out his wrath upon the earth and upon unrepentant, God-rejecting people. How do we know this? How do we know that the great tribulation is a time when God is going to pour out his wrath? Well, listen to me. It, over in Revelation chapter 6, we're going to get into this next Tuesday, but over in Revelation chapter 6, we have the beginning of the great tribulation, and this is what we're told in verses 15 through 17. We're going to put it up on the screens. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in, in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from what? From the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. So again, according to scripture, I'm not making this up. According to scripture, the great tribulation is clearly a time when God is going to pour out his wrath upon the church. So this raises a question, right? It raises a very important question. Will God allow his church, will God allow Christians to go through part or all of his wrath, all of the great tribulation, and experience the judgments that he's going to pour out upon the earth? I, personally, I find it very hard to believe that the God of the Bible is going to allow his church, his bride is what we call it, his church to go through such horrible judgments and his wrath that he's going to pour out upon the earth. I just have a hard time believing that God is going to do that. And this is one of the reasons why I take the pre-tribulational rapture point of view. But here's the thing. Can we back it up with Scripture? Can we back it up with Scripture that God has not appointed his church, his Christians, to, to his wrath, to his judgment? Well, yeah, yeah we can. I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> Listen, let me read to you a couple of Scriptures w without any comment. Let me just allow the Scriptures to speak for themselves. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. Everything is going to be on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath. I can just stop there. I can just stop right there. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. How about this one? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. How about another one? Nahum. Let's go into the Old Testament. The prophet Nahum said in chapter 1, verse 2, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for who? For his enemies. Not his church. Not Christians. He reserves wrath for his enemies. How about this? In Genesis chapter 7, we have the recording of the great flood. God flooded the earth, right? It was a worldwide flood, and we know that it was God's judgment upon sinful man. What did God do before the flood? He removed the righteous. He took Noah, and he took his family. He safely placed them there on the ark. We're told God is the one who closed the door to the ark. God himself closed the door. He secured them in there. And, 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 and why did he do this? Because they were righteous and because they were God's people. And God said the righteous will not go through the judgment. In Genesis chapters 18 and 19, we have the uh, recording of, of, of um, God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. What did he do before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? God rescued this guy named Lot and his family before he pour, poured out his wrath before he poured out his judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because they were righteous, because they were God's people, and God said, the righteous, my people, will not go through judgment, will not go through my wrath. And I believe the same will be true for the church. Before God pours out his wrath, before God pours out his judgment in the great tribulation, he is going to snatch away, he's going to suddenly remove the church, Christians, from this earth. And from what I understand in the Bible... Um, and it's okay if you disagree with me on this, but from what I understand in the Bible, it would go completely against God's character for him to pour out his wrath and his judgment and allow his people to go through it. I just don't understand why God would allow his church, his people, to go through his wrath and his judgment. So again, the first reason why I believe in a pre-tribulational rapture is because, look, I mean, 
the clear teaching of the Bible says that God hasn't appointed Christians or his church to his wrath. Now look at the second reason. The second reason why I believe in the pre-tribulational rapture is because Revelation chapter 3 verses 10 through 11 clearly teach us that the church will be kept from the great tribulation. Let me read to you from Revelation chapter 3 verses 10 through 11. This is what we're told. Because you have kept my command, this is Jesus Christ himself speaking, because you have kept my command to preserve, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell in the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. And we know that this speaks of the great tribulation. Look at the words of Jesus very closely here. And notice the phrase in verse 10, I also will keep you from. That's very important here, that phrase. I also will keep you from. In the Greek, this phrase means I will prevent you from entering into. I will prevent you from entering into. Now keep that in mind. When you read verse 10, a lot of the mid-trib guys and a lot of the post-trib guys, they misinterpret what I just told you. They read verse 10 where it says, where Jesus says, I also will keep you from, and they will tell you that, uh, um, that Christians will go through part or all of the great tribulation, but they'll go through it unharmed. Because Jesus is saying, I also will keep you from, and they're saying, Jesus is saying, I'll also keep you from the wrath, from the judgments. I'll protect you from those things. That is not what Jesus is saying here. When you look at the context of it, and when you look at the exact wording, what Jesus is saying here is this. He's saying that, um, that the Christians, the church, will be kept from the very time of the event. Jesus will prevent the church, he'll prevent Christians from I even entering into the great tribulation. And so that's why we believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. We don't believe that God is going to allow us to go through part or all of it and he's going to protect us in it. No, we don't believe that because it, it, it's still his wrath, it's still his judgment. It goes back to reason number one. We believe that God is going to clearly uh, prevent us from even entering into that time of history. We're not even going to enter into the great tribulation. And how does he do this? Verse 11 tells us, this is in Revelation chapter 3, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Jesus is coming for his church. Jesus is coming for you, Christian, and, and he's coming by way of the rapture. And, 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 and I tell you, I, I just, I don't know any other way to interpret it. What else can it mean? What else can it mean? So this is the second reason why I believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. Because simply Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 clearly teach us that the church is going to be kept from the great tribulation. Now let me give you the third reason. The third reason I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is because the church, listen to this carefully, this is one of my favorite arguments to bring up to the mid and post-trib guys. I mean, I'm just sitting there listening to them talk, 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 talk. And I say, I wait, I say, oh, let me, let me ask you about this. And then they're just like, oh, okay. This is one of my favorite arguments. You ready for this? I love this. Because the church is not mentioned at all in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 18, which what, what do those chapters record for us? You remember? It, it records for us the great tribulation, God's wrath, God's judgment upon an unrepentant world. In the first three chapters, listen to this. We've studied, we've, we've been through this. In the first three chapters of Revelation, you know how many times the word church or churches is used? It's used 19 times in three chapters. 19 times. And then all of a sudden, somebody explain this to me. All of a sudden you get to the Great Tribulation, which begins at chapter 6 and progresses through chapter 18. And how many times is the church mentioned in those chapters? Not one time. Not one time. And so we have to assume that if God doesn't rapture the church before the great tribulation, and, and, and that the church would be mentioned with similar frequency in the rest of the chapters in the book of Revelation. And so it's not the case. We have to reasonably assume by the context of Scripture uh, that the church Christians are not mentioned in the chapters that detail the great tribulation. And since they're not mentioned there, it's because they're gone. They're nowhere to be found. 
because they're in heaven because Jesus snatched them away. He took them away. And so that's the third reason why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. The fourth and final reason I'll give you tonight on why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is because Jesus clearly taught us that he would come soon and to be ready. Now, this is another argument that I love to bring up to the mid-trib guys and the post-trib guys. Watch where I go with this. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. I'm going to read four scriptures to you here that I'm going to make a point. Matthew 24, verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Now, before I read any further, just know this. The New Testament, the Bible altogether, but especially the New Testament, is littered with this truth that Jesus is coming quickly. Now, keep that in mind. You'll understand where I'm going with this. So, again, Matthew 24, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Matthew 25, 13, Jesus says, watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Mark chapter 13, verses 35 through 37, Jesus says, watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping, and what I say to you, I say to all, watch. And then let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. The clear understanding of Scripture is this. Jesus is constantly telling his church all throughout the Scriptures to watch, to be ready. You don't know when I'm coming. There won't be an indication, but watch and be ready because I am coming. When you apply this truth to the different positions of the time of the rapture, the mid-tribulationists and the post-tribulationists have a bit of a problem. Because listen, the mid-tribulation guys, they're the guys who say that Jesus is coming back halfway, three and a half years after the great tribulation begins. They cannot read scripture and point to the fact that Jesus is coming quickly. They, they just can't do it. Because they, they, if they hold that view, we know when the great tribulation begins, we, 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 trust me, if you're here, you're going to know when the great tribulation begins. There's going to be no doubt about it. There's people out there that say, ah, oh, you really won't know. And all that. No, you will know when the great tribulation begins. And you can mark on your calendar when the great tribulation begins. You can mark three and a half years later, and you know when Jesus is going to come if you hold a mid-tribulation point of view. You're going to say three and a half years later, Jesus is going to rapture the church. You cannot say, if you hold that view, oh, Jesus is coming quickly. Watch, be sober, be ready for him and stuff like that. You just can't do it. The post-tribulation guys, they have a little bit more of a problem. They can't say that Jesus is coming back at any time. The only thing that they can say is that, oh, when the great tribulation begins, mark it on your calendar. Seven years later is when Jesus is going to rapture the church. They can't even read the scriptures and say, watch, be sober, be ready. Jesus can come at any moment. They can't say it. And so they have a bit of a problem there. Friends, you do understand this doesn't line up with scripture. Um, and I, I, I just don't see how it fits. And I'll tell you something else. This is where I want, I want you to understand. Please make sure you hear this. This is, this is good stuff I'm about to tell you. We know, you're going to see this next Tuesday as we enter into chapter 6, the, where the great tribulation begins in Revelation. We know that the Antichrist will be revealed during the first half, the first three and a half years of the great tribulation. And again, we're going to study this more when we get back to Revelation. But listen, if you hold a mid-tribulational point of view, if you hold a post-tribulational position, you have to admit you're not looking for Jesus to come first. Who are you looking to come first? You're looking for the Antichrist. You cannot read the scriptures and say, we're looking for Jesus. We're looking for Jesus to rapture the church. We're looking for Jesus to come because you're looking for the Antichrist if you hold those two positions. I want you to understand my position. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. That's what I hold to. That's why I have a pre-tribulational rapture point of view and a position that I hold 
very strong to because I don't look at it and say, oh, you know what? Um, the Antichrist is going to come, and when we know that the Antichrist is going to come, then it doesn't matter if you're mid-trib or post-trib. You know that either three and a half years or seven years later, Jesus is going to rapture the church. And, and so, again, you're looking for the Antichrist, whether you realize it or not, if you hold a mid- or tr post-trip point of view. You're not looking for Jesus Christ to rapture the church. And so, there you have it. Four reasons why I believe in the pre-tribulational rapture. I'll list them all for you again because the Bible clearly teaches that God has not appointed Christians, his church, to his wrath. That's number one. Number two, because Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 through 11 clearly teach us that the church isn't even mentioned in the chapters. Um, or I'm sorry, I got to hit myself. Uh, 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 point number two was Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 to 11 clearly teaches us that the church will be kept from the great tribulation. Number three is what I was just mentioning. The church isn't even mentioned in Revelation chapter 6 through 18, which record the great tribulation. And number four, because Jesus clearly taught us to be ready because he's going to come soon and he's going to snatch away. He's going to remove the church from the earth. Now, listen, my challenge for you is this. I have studied this in depth. I've studied it in Bible college. I've studied it all throughout the years. My challenge for you is this. I believe that I've done at least an okay job tonight. I believe I've made a very strong argument for a pre-tribulational rapture position and it's my hope that you would take that position because I believe it's a biblical position. But I'm asking you and I'm encouraging, I'm challenging you. Don't take my word for it. You go back and you study the scriptures and you study all three points of view and you come up with your own conclusion. Um, um, because, listen, I mean, it, it is a very important topic. Um, I'll give you a great place to start. It's a resource that I use all the time. I use it for sermon prep. Uh, I use it for my personal studies. It's a resource that is put together by a Calvary Chapel pastor. Um, it, it's this. It's, it's, it's a website. It's called gotquestions.org. Gotquestions.org. Let me tell you, people, if you've done this, don't be offended because I, I do this to everybody. People will write me a question. They'll say, Pastor Nick, what do you think about um, cremation versus burial? Use that for an example. I'll go to gotquestions.org, copy the link from there, and I'll send them the article and let them read it. I mean, I use that website so much, they should be paying me. You know, seriously, I use it a lot. It's a great website, and, and, and I highly recommend it for all of your questions. But listen, don't be afraid to ask me a question. I, I will always answer it. I love being asked questions. Now, as we begin to end our time together this evening, allow me to leave you with one final thought. If you are a Christian... You must understand, on the timetable of end-time prophetic events, the rapture of the church is next. And there is nothing else that needs to happen. There's no prophetic event that needs to happen before Jesus suddenly removes and takes away his church from the earth. Um, um, now, this doesn't mean that we know the day or the hour of when he's coming. We, we don't know that. Uh, that is something that the Bible absolutely does not reveal to us, although so many people have tried to pinpoint it. Um, all we're told is that Jesus is coming soon to watch and be ready. Titus chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, it's one of my favorite verses. It tells us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Guys, as we live out our Christian lives in this world, our attitude must be one of hope that Jesus is coming back soon. Um, and, and not only should our attitude be that of hope, but our lives, our very Christian lives should reflect the fact that we believe that Jesus is coming back soon like he said. And, and, and listen, let me ask you just a, 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 very, um, a very simple question, and you answer it honestly in your heart, quietly in your heart. Let's say we did know the day and the hour, and let's say it's coming up real soon. In two weeks, God is going to rapture the church. Man. 
I'm sorry. <coughs> Let's say we knew that. Two weeks from now, God's going to rapture the church. How differently would you live your life? I'm going to tell you something. Whatever, the, whatever you answer in your heart is probably what you should be doing right now. Mend the relationships. Um, share your faith. Get active and serve in your church. Live a holy and righteous and pleasing life before the Lord. Because listen, the fact of the matter is this. Jesus is coming soon. And he is going to snatch away. He's going to take the church from this earth. And, and he's going to bring us up into heaven. And it can happen at any moment. There's nothing else that needs to happen in the end time prophetic events for God to rapture his church. You know, I want to be bold with you tonight. I'll just say a few things that's on my mind, um, that come to my mind. If you struggle with certain things like anger, man, it's, it's time to get those things right. We know anger is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. We know anger, when you're angry and, and all this, you're not, you're not operating, you're not living within the guardrails of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit and all. And how, how would you like to have that uncontrolled anger and you're just, you're in an act of rage. You're a Christian, but you struggle with anger. And in the midst of uncontrollable rage, God raptures the church. And you're caught up, you're suddenly taken away, and you're just in a moment of anger. I mean, it's time to get that stuff controlled. Let, 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 let's say you, you deal with some, um, let's just say destructive habits, whatever it may be. It may be pornography. It may be alcohol, drugs, whatever it is. You fill in the blank. How would you like to be in the midst of entertaining your mind, your life, with those destructive habits or under the influence of those destructive habits? And you're a Christian and all of a sudden, God snatches away and takes away his church. I'm telling you, the scriptures are very clear about this matter. Jesus himself tells us to be sober, that is to have the right mind, don't be under the influence of anything. It even extends beyond alcohol and, 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 and drugs and all this stuff. Be sober, have the right mind. Be watchful, be ready. For his return. And that's what Jesus tells us. His own words. Live soberly. Live righteously. Live godly in this present age. And look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And so that's my encouragement to you guys. Because Jesus is coming soon for his church. And we are called to live our, our lives in a way that says that we believe that. Amen? Father, we love you, and we love your word, and we ask that you would take the truths of this word and embed them deep down into our hearts. I pray, Lord, that I've, I really do, Lord. I pray that I've rightly divided your word tonight. I pray that I've presented truth and that you would take that truth and, um, and allow us to remember it and apply it to our lives. If I've said anything wrong, anything that's not in accordance to your word, Lord, erase it from our minds. Allow us to forget it, Lord. At least have mercy on me in that, Lord. So this is a tough subject, Lord. You know, it's a controversial subject within the Christian church. But I believe we hold the right position, Lord, the pre-tribulational rapture. We believe that you're going to take us away before the tribulation for the biblical reasons that we listed tonight. And we say to you, Lord, as a community of believers, those sitting in here tonight, those watching online, Lord, we want to commit our life to you. If there's anything unrighteous in our life, anything that's displeasing to you, Lord, we don't want to be caught up in those things when you rapture the church. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to overcome. We ask that you would allow us, by the power of your spirit, to live a life that is sober and righteous and uh, godly, a life that's pleasing to you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us the hope to be able to look up and to be watchful and ever ready for you to snatch us away and to take us away into heaven, Lord. 
Do that good work, Lord. We love you. We love your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you guys have a great night. Thanks for coming out tonight. And those of you watching online, thanks for watching as well. You guys have a great night.